My name is Judith Altman. I was born on October 10, 1924, in Jasina, Czechoslovakia. My family was a wonderful, wonderful family. My father's name was Hirsch. My father was known for the town to be a, the best person. So when they said, if there is an, any, any poor person that has no place to stay over Shabbat, they said, go up to Hersh Borochana, who was called, uh, uh, he was called the Hersh Malach, means the angel, an angel. And they came to our house, they got food, they had a bath, and they had a room to sleep over. It gave me a foundation of give, give as much as you can. It's the biggest mitzvah you can do. My mother was Rosa Schnabel. She was 16 years old when she married my father. My father was married before, and his first wife died in childbirth with the child. So that my, the rest of my Schnabel family left to the United States in 1918. My grandmother, my two uncles, my two aunts, and only my mother and another aunt remained in Yasina. My mother was very happy, of course, so she had the first child she had was a daughter. Her name was Charlotte. My next, sis, my next sibling in line was Ira. The following one was Bernard. The th next one is Emmanuel, and I was the last one. We were six children because my step, my first sister, half sister, was uh, the daughter of the first wife of my father who died in childbirth. It was a very close family. We lived six kilometers from the town. It was called Mohelke. Uh, my father has a general store. You could buy anything from a needle to a horse. And uh, we also had a farm. We had horses. We had cows. We just lived a very, very comfortable life. All our childhood, all my siblings, they had a certain responsibility. They had to help in the store. When the biggest business day was Sunday, because the workers didn't work, so they came to the store and they did shopping for the whole week. So we had to work, help out. My mom was a fantastic cook and, and a gardener. We had the nicest, the most beautiful garden of them all. We had to help. Yes, we did have a, a woman who helped in the garden. We had a woman that took care of the horses and cows, and we had a woman in the house who cleaned the house and helped whenever it's necessary. She also painted the walls, but she liked to drink. And of course, we also had, to, we had a permission to sell liquor. One day, we, I came home from school, and my mom came home from buying for the store. And guess what? Dorothy was on the floor. The, the, the paint was spilled. And we asked her, what happened, Dorothy? She spoke only Russian. So she said, ja, wissi, papa, pap, no. she, she, I spilled the paint. Of course, she was dead drunk. So that was, but we had responsibility. However, we also had to learn how to cook. We had to learn the garden, and we had to help my mom. Because by the time we got up at 8 o'clock, my mother had already baked 24 loaves of bread, which by 10 o'clock they were all gone, because her baking was the best. Very interesting with my mother doing all that, taking care of the house, taking care of the business. She had time enough in the evening to play cards with us or dreidel or whatever. And my father 
was a great believer in learning, as much as you can. We had a German teacher from the age of three of every of the oldest sister. We had to learn. And the, she literally derived a livelihood from us. She had it from my older sister until me, the youngest. I had, a, I had an English teacher from the age of 10. My father believed whatever you learn, it's going to take you through life. What was the Jewishness of your home? If I think of my home, I just have good, wonderful memories, but painful as well. The happy ones what the, the Shabbat, the Friday night, the holidays. My parents were definitely observant. My father was learned he could have been a rabbi, but he chose to be a businessman. He was a very, very religious man. My father had a great influence on all of us. My three brothers had to go to shul every Shabbos, whether he li they liked it or not. I remember one particular incident. It was Erev Yom Kippur, and my younger, my younger brother, who was 11 years older than myself, he came late because he was in the army, and he traveled. It was, almost, it was still Shabbat, so he was very upset. But he said to Papa, I'm sorry. And Papa said, that is not your fault. You had to do what you had to do. And we had a very good relationship with the, with the people, with the Rutanian. They were, the inhabitants of there were predominantly Rutanians, and the Czechs were the, the gendarme, they were the, the police and the fine, finance, they called them. We had Czech schools, we had Russian schools. We Jewish children went to the Czech school. It was wonderful. We had, I remember the name of every teacher from way back. Give uh, me a name. Well, uh, Drahanyowski, Prashek, Vanek, Dobrava. I, they were just wonderful. I had predominantly non Jewish friends. But of course, in the school, I would say there was a third of of the class, but of Jew Jewish children. You know, American Jews have this image of Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof and the town of Anatevka and the feeling that that's what the Jewish community was at the end of the 19th century going into the 20th century. Is there anything similar to in your life growing up that reminds you of Tevye when you watch the musical yourself? Not Yasina is not to compare to Anatevka. Yasina was a much more modern town. We had, we had a theater, we had, two, we had a movie, we had how many? We had many, many schools. In every district, there was a Czech school. Not in every district was a Czech school. There was in many of them. But in my district, there was only the Ukrainian, a Russian school. So that's why I went to my sister. I stayed with my sister from uh, Sunday night until Friday in order to go to the first four years of the Czech school. The following schools, middle school, I was going from home, six, kilomet six kilometers walking. We had two big, beautiful temples in town. We had a mikvah. We had our rabbi was a, um, a rabbi who had a doctor degree from Vienna. And it was a very modern, modern city, hotels, uh, beautiful uh, restaurants. It was a modern city. I had a rabbi coming to me every single day to teach me, uh, uh, he, to read. 
when my uncle came to visit from America, my father showed off. I was about six years, and I knew Kedisha and Borchi by heart. How many languages did you speak as a child? As a child, I spoke four, because German uh, from the age of three. Czech was my language. My mother spoke Hungarian, and my father spoke Yiddish. In, in the Russian, I know from the t customer. And at some point, you learned English well. Well, English I learned. I had a teacher at the age of 10. When you were growing up, was there anti-Semitism in your community? I did not know any anti-Semitism. I did not feel our, all our business, all our customers were not Jewish people. They, were, they understood that we were Jews, but they did not. No, I never heard anything. My father's business was, was, very, was going very well because we lived in the woods, rather in the woods. And what happened? Many people came from different, different parts because we didn't have that many people that would cut down the trees. Those were cut down. They were, they were transferred on the, on the river. And uh, when they went further down to next cities. From there, they were transferred to different countries. Paper was made out of it. So it was, the town was a very lucrative business. Uh, where we lived, there was only one other Jewish family walking distance. We had, we, in, the, in the area of where I lived, Mohelki, there was no big temple. But we had a, a one house where we called a shtibel. And my father had his own Sefer Torah. And when they, when they bought the Torot from Prague here to Stanford, Connecticut, I was, somebody bought one of these Torot and I carried it up to the temple. And when I looked, I said, is that my father's Torah? How I wish I would know. Your brother was in the army? All three of them. Which army? And the che my three brothers were all in the Czechoslovak army in the town of Olomouc. All three of them, at a different time, of course, but they were all trained there. Did they experience anti-Semitism in the army? I never, I, I never recall my brothers coming home and saying anything of that account. My younger brother, at the time, which was already at the time when Hitler might have come to power, he came home from school one day and he said to Papa, what's going on? Suddenly I'm called Jewish. It did not happen before. But my father said, don't pay any attention. It'll be fine. He was an optimist from way back. You described this lovely life. What's the first thing you notice or experience that the darkness is coming? My father had a brother who lived in Vienna. He corresponded with him very frequently. We got letters from my uncle, Moshe was his name. He was a rabbi in Vienna. And he said, there is a storm coming. My father said, oh, not, don't worry. He was an optimist from way back. My father, my uncle wrote back. He said, don't take it so lightly, Hirsch. There is a storm coming. But then, after Hitler occupied Austria, that's when we felt that there's something is not doing, you know, going well. I, again, my brother came home from school. He said, suddenly I'm being called a Jew. But we still, we were so patriotic and we were so Czech. Uh, there was a poem that I remember it now. This is so many years. 
šuselka nám píše, stejné mečka žíše, abychom šli něco pomoct, že jim kručí v břiše. Víš se, that šuselka name is telling us that she writes that uh, šuselka píše, že je Yeah, we, we, we know the girl from Germany is call, uh, saying that she has, that her stomach is growling, that she is hungry, and in what we say, what, what you crumbled in, what you put into your dish, eat it yourself. So we were so patriotic, and we were walking to school with a button on our jacket, we will not give in. Unfortunately, that did not happen because the, my brother was already dressed in the, in the uniform. He was ready in case the Germans invite us that he is ready to fight. At this point, my, my sister, my oldest sister was married and lived in my hometown. She had a son seven, 16 and a daughter 14, the same age as I was. My next, uh, my next sister in line was married to a Polish Jew, and she lived in a small town in Poland, Mikulichin. My following brother was Ira, who was married and lived in Belgium and had a wife with two sons. My following brother was Bernard. He was the only one that uh, was able to get papers in time and go to Belgium. From there, he came to the United States. My following brother was Emmanuel. He was the dent. He went to dental school, and uh, he himself went to Belgium at the age of 21, and smuggled came to the United States illegally, hidden in the bottom. Came to Ellis Island, was caught and was sent back to, the, to Czechoslovakia. Subsequently, went to the army. I was the only one, the youngest one. After all that, and my, my, brothers were, my brother was already in the army, my father realized that it is getting serious. However, at this point, my mother asked the family to send affidavits and papers. And we, f we got them, my father got them, but he still said, they wouldn't take me. I was an officer in the First World War. They will not take me. He still believed. We could have gotten out just after my brother left, but my father did not want. He says, I'm going to come to America. What am I going to do? I don't speak the language. What am I, I'm going to be a Malamut? That's not for me. So what happens? So at, what, at what point does life really begin to change for you? And tell me how it changes. At, in 1939, when Hitler occupied Czech, Sudeten, the part of Czechoslovakia, and in March 39, he just marched into Prague and settled himself in the castles. That's when we saw that the danger begins. At that same time, the part where we live was Karpato, Ukraine. It, was, it belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire before the First World War. After that, it was given in 1918, the Czechs got that part, and we had most wonderful 21 years democrat in a democratic country. At that point, that part of, of uh, Czechoslovakia was given back to Hungary. Unfortunately, Hungary was a Nazi regime as well, so we had both. After the occupation, our life has changed drastically. But that was for all over Europe, wherever Hitler occupied. Every Jew, the Jews were taken into ghettos. 
every Jewish man from the age of 18 to 45 was taken to slave labor camp. And that happened in Yasina. However, there was three days where there was a no, no, uh, it did not belong to anybody. It did not belong yet to, to Hungary. And it did not belong anymore to the Czechs. The Czechs left. So we were there. The Ukrainians, the Ruthenians, and called themselves Ruthenians and Ukrainians, they wanted a country of their own. So it was, it was called and they, uh, a, a country of a very short time. I don't I have the name at home. Anyway. Uh, so what happened? They had in for many Jews that they they wanted to they wanted to pay back. So they built a guillotine on the on a big mountain in our hometown, and they they were ready to hang many people. My mother's name was on that list because. My father was a very good man, and he just, whenever the woman came in and she said, I have 10 children, I have no, could I have 10 kilo of flour? He gave it to her and didn't even write it down. But my mother, you cannot do business on an emotional basis, so she said, we, we need to get back paid. So that's why they, her name was on that list. Rosenthal was on their name, they were big. They had a shoe store. They were on it, and and even the 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 name of that uh, Ukrainian was Klempush. And fortunately enough, it will sound ironic to anybody to hear that we prayed that the, either the Germans or Hungarians should move in in order to be saved, not not to be killed by the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians would have killed you. Yes. Anyway, they would have. The, the, then the anti-Semitism was quiet. It wasn't open. You describe what's happening throughout Europe, but does it happen to you? Is your father taken to a slave labor camp? Are you moved? No, he was old. He was old already, but my brother was taken to slave labor camp, Emmanuel, the younger one. And Bernard was in America, and Ira was in Belgium. What happened to you? What happened to us? The store, they put in a man there, and the proceeds from the business was going to the government. They, this, they used the house, the big house where we were, they used whenever the German officers were going closer to Poland, they stayed in our house. And my father was a very religious man, so he had a beard. So. Whenever they saw him, they beat him. So he was hiding on the, in, the, in, the, in the attic. attic. And every time when there was an officer living in our, in our house, he said, why are you going up to the attic? I said, I'm bringing food to my father because your soldiers are beating him up. He says, as long as I'm in the house, you don't have to worry. We were constantly afraid what's happening. The business was, people did not come to, to buy even from them. They still thought it was a Jewish store. We could not go to school. One day they sent out a note, Jewish children can no longer go to school. What did you think? We could not understand. Why can't I go to school? Well, they said, Jews, they cannot have a radio. They cannot do this. We, we knew, we heard what's happening. We knew that Hitler was very vocal. He, you put on the radio all you heard, Ich will die Welt erobern. I will conquer the world. You couldn't help not hearing that. You couldn't. But I met my friend, and she said, Judy, why weren't you in school? Because I'm Jewish. But you were Jewish yesterday. 
she could not understand it. You can't, suddenly you are terribly afraid. Of course, the news that you hear what's happening in Poland. What did you hear? We heard that the Jews are being gathered and put into ghettos, and that they're being killed. My sister lives in a small town, Mikulichin. So they, they took every animal away from us. They confiscated. But they left us one cow. So my mother was able to save up some butter, some cheese, and some bread, and some, some thing from our garden. And she hired a, a one peasant and paid him to take the train to Mikulichin, to Poland. One day, he comes back with the satchel, with the food, and he says, I could not deliver to, food to Charlotte, but I witnessed her execution. What they did in the town, they gathered all the Jews from Mikulichin, made them go out of town, made them dig their own grave, made them get undressed completely naked. In the brutality, they shot the children first, the husbands later, and at the end, the mothers. This is what he told my parents. And now, when I go around, I, heard, I met father, that French father, what's his name, father? The boy? The boy. I met him personally. And he said that this happened. 2.2 million Jews were killed in that way, killed by bullet, because at that point in Germany, up until 1942, this is the way that they killed the Jews. When the peasant comes to tell your mother? My parents. Are you present? Yes. You hear the same story? I heard the same story. Wasn't it devastating? It was the most horrible thing. I, I can't forget. A three-year-old little girl and seven-year-old boy. But this still happens far away. Not so far away. Mm -hmm. Not so far away at all. Because we were, pre we were prepared that this will happen in our area. So what did my mother do? She was a smart businesswoman. What she did, she cha she, wherever she could do, she bought gold pieces. Gold, because they said, if you have money, you might be able to save your life. And that's what she did. But the news that came in, and the slave labor people, Yasina was bordering Poland. so. All the troops that were going to Poland pass our town. It was an unbelievable. We knew that no, nothing good will come out. But it was too late for my father to leave. They would not let us out anymore. But I frightened. Indeed, I was. I was frightened. But what could we do? Hiding? There's hardly a chance. In our town, there was nobody that offered to save us. Did your friends ever begin to leave you, or they stayed with you? They all left. The Czechs left. Anybody who even wasn't employed, but was a Czechoslovak, he left. So what we left, the, the Ruthenian and the Hungarian that lived there, and their pa grandparents lived there, they ignored us. They, they were not offensive. They did not. Sometimes they reported on the Jew, but they did not help. They were not friendly. In fact, when they took us away from home, which I'll come later, it was Easter Sunday, and we were walking in a row together, father and my mother and myself, and it was Easter Sunday, and they were going to church with their basket, and they did not say a word. 
At some point, do your friends stop speaking to you? They didn't stop speaking, but they did not socialize anymore. They did not ignore, but they, most of my friends were really the Czechs. Who left? Left. Your father was beaten? Yes, and pulled by the beard. And did you ever see that? I, I knew about it because my father didn't scream. He just let them do, and, and he, he didn't come down. He was mostly hidden. He did not want to show his, himself. He was frightened. He was. Something very sad in the, in the air, and it was Mozart, the last day of Passover. We were put it, trying to put away the dishes already, the Passover. So it was, I think it was a Sunday, I'm not sure. So the morning, it was 6.30 in the morning, two SS men and two Hungarian gendarmes knocked on our window. You have a half hour. Take all your money and take all your jewels, enough food for a day, and start walking. What did, we had no bread in the house, so what do you take? My father took his talis in a, in a sitter and nothing else. My mother said, I am going into the spice and I'm going to drink something. I said, Mommy, you have time to die. Don't do anything. Because we had every, all kind of drinks, all kind of alcohol. He, she was ready to drink. I, to commit suicide? I'm sorry? To commit suicide? Yes. She had something in that she could drink? Well, I think it was like a 90 cent vodka. I don't know what she wanted to drink. But she, she was considered ready. suicide. Yeah. It, was, it was a dark room where we kept all kind of things there. And she was going, I'm going to do that. I don't want them to kill me. I said, Mommy, come, don't do it. You have time to die. So, and I took my manicure set. That was my birthday present. And we had nothing to take because the matzahs, only matzahs left and whatever, something cooked. And How we, old were you? I was at that time 16 already. And we started marching. We were actually not the last family. Well, the last family was a family of six children and the parents. The father was deaf and mute. Uh, he was, they were very poor. He could not work because nobody would hire him. She had one cow. That one cow, she, she used the milk to make butter, sold the butter, and only the, the, butter, the, the skim milk was left. And from that they lived. They only had enough money to buy cornmeal and live on porridge. The only time they had, my mother baked challah for Shabbat, she gives them, and she gives them a bread, one bread. But one bread for sick, for eight people, was nothing. But she was so poor, she had a sister living in the United States. Her name was Mrs. Cantor. And since I knew how to write English, she asked me to write a letter to her sister. And she said, ask, ask my sister to send me some money. The sister sent her $5, for which Shandle, that's the name of the neighbor, could, eat, could feed the whole week her whole family. So what happened? There came out a law right after Hitler occupied Czechoslovakia. And that pertained to all of Europe, to every country, to Jews only. Those that didn't pay taxes in 1850, the, the family was automatically deported. They were deported, not necessarily to where they were born, maybe France, maybe England, but they were deported to Poland. 
There were days when buses and trains were coming through Yasina to Poland. Most of them never made it to the border. They were shot in the hills of our, of our area. One morning, about two weeks before we were taken away from home, the gendarmes came, they gathered the, the family, and they shot them about a half hour from our home, all eight. A peasant came down to air, tell my father, can you arrange that those eight Jews should be buried before my father, had he, had, had he been caught, he would have been punished. So they buried the bodies. Anyway, so here we are. We are walking down. We were the last family. The next family lived about two kilometers from our home. They were prepared. They were old people. There was one, one old man. They had to carry him. There was, no, there was no wheelchair. There was no walker. They had to carry him. We came down six kilometers. By then, there were quite a few because everybody was prepared. We came down, and we were told to walk to the cemetery that was up on a hill. And my father said, how convenient. They're going to shoot us there so they don't have to bring us to be buried. We walked up to that cemetery. It's raining. It's cold. We were sitting on the graves of our ancestors and waiting, waiting. What is going to be with us? There is at this point, there are all the Jews, which is 5,000 Jews, 5,000. There was, the town had 15,000 inhabitants. Out of that was 5,000 Jews. You knew many of these people. I knew most of them. My sister lived 24 kilometers, 12 kilometers from my hometown, 24 to go back and forth. We knew that nothing good will happen. We did not know at this point, hearing what happened to Charlotte in Poland, we expected the similar situation. Did you want to run away? There was no way. My friend's mother ran away, and she was shot in the back. There was no way to run away. We were one whole week at the, at the cemetery. We How were did you eat? Very little, whatever we took along. But it was Easter Sunday, and in the, in the churches, the priests announced it. Whoever wants to bring some food to the Jews up on the Jewish cemetery, it, you do a good deed. Some of them did, and some of them didn't. There was no other food, only that. After a week, we were told to go to the railroad. It was at least two and a half kilometers walk. We came to the train, and we were taken to Hungary, to a town called Mate Solko, regular train. And we don't know where we are going. If you ask the Hungarian guy, he doesn't even look at you, doesn't even answer. But are you relieved because you weren't shot at the cemetery? We did not expect to sh that they were going to shoot us there. We did not expect that for some, I don't remember being frightened of that. You were with your mother and your father? With my mother and my On father. The train. And my sister and my brother-in-law and, and my nephew and my niece. All of you? All, all of us. And all the ten. All and and did you stay, when you say you were with them, was it as if your family was a unit on this train? Yes. We were all, to, we tried not to separate ourselves at all. So we came to that town of Mate Soko. It was a very, it was rather, rather large to accommodate that many thousands of people. And there we lived in little houses that they, in fact, they, paid a lot of money for the Hungarians to move out and, and leave the house. We were there, put in 30 families into one, into one house. But there was a bathroom and there was a shelter. Once a day, you got a bowl of soup and maybe a piece of bread. When I hear this story, I wonder to myself, how do 
people endure and survive what you're describing? It is very, it is very difficult to understand and to even, even myself today, when I think back, how could we endure? But the human being is really stronger than he knows. And you stand there and you say, but my father never, never left not to pray in the morning and at night. Their, their belief was unbelievable. In that ghetto, they, the older people, they weren't old at that time. My mother wasn't old, was 50 some odd. But uh, the young people, we cleaned the ghetto. We took care of children, we watched children. And, we were still, but there were the rumors. This is preparing for other things. Were people nice to each other? Within, yes. Within the camp, within the ghetto, they were neighborly. We usually stuck to the time. Yasina was in one place, Rahobo was in another one. And we sort of, there were a lot of Hungarian Jews and a lot of Slovak Jews, so we, but the Yasina stood within themselves, you know, and waiting, ac actually waiting from day to day. Then one morning we were told to take whatever the little satchel, as little as you can, and go to the railroad. This time we were put into cattle cars. They put in 65 to 75 people in one of the cars. And was that where you were? In one of the, yes. And still, with my family sticking to one another, my sister and her family, and my father and mother. All of you in one box car? Yes, 65 to 75 people from my hometown. Standing? Standing. There was no place to even think of sitting down. And they closed it with an iron bar. It's dark. There is no air, only a little bit of a window on top. You say, this is the end. This is the end. So people, people crying? People crying. Children were crying. They gave us an empty bowl to use as a bathroom and one filled with water. This is going to be the end. So we sit, we stand, you cannot sit. There is no place to sit. Breathing is already getting difficult. They started in the morning to take us from the ghetto to the railroad to load us. And they wait till all the people are loaded into additional cattle cars. The following morning, we did not leave till the following morning. And we started moving. At this point, we are moving very slowly. The first night, a man dies. What do we do with the body, we ask? Put him in a corner. There was no corner. The water was gone. The, the cable, the empty thing with, from the bathroom is full. The stench is unbelievable. The following morning, Two, the, the SS men, there are no more gendarmes, only SS men. The SS men tell, take two men to carry out the, the, the dirt, uh, cable, the uh, dish, or whatever you call it, buckle, and bring back. They close the door again and we move. We move very, very slowly. There was. What do you do? What you stand, you can barely breathe. People are choking, they cannot breathe. Children talk, are screaming. Do you, you talk to each other? Yes, you talk and you say, well, maybe, maybe we could do, maybe we could jump out when they open. But there they stand with the gun, with the SS man with the gun. We don't know. The father, my father's praying. What happened? Women giving birth. So we have nothing. We have no light, no, no nothing. So give the undershirt to put, to wrap the baby in an undershirt. It is an unbelievable thing to describe. It isn't death yet, but it's almost worse than death. 
what happens is people went crazy, went literally crazy. So they start hitting others and screaming. And the SS man said, if that noise doesn't stop, we'll take all of you out and shoot you there on the spot. So we had to tie their mouth, tie their hands to keep them quiet. Finally, after four and a half days, it was the 21st of May, the doors opened. What year? That was 1944. The doors opened, and we, we see men in the striped uniform running back and forth, rouse, out. We say, vis enemies, this is those, this is a Gehenna. That is hell. And they throw out people. All of us from my family, we were able to stand up. And, and they put a, a little, not a step ladder, just to slide down. I don't even remember exactly. I jumped down. And we were told, line up in a row of five, women separate and men separate. There is my mother, my sister, my aunt, my niece, and myself, and my aunt's three, ch three children, two, four, and six. Then there is the men's row, my father, my brother-in-law, my uncle, my nephew, and another man. And you see the SS man with the dog running back and forth, not giving orders. The orders are given by the men in the striped uniform. And we stand in line and we talk. What's going to happen? Where are we? There is a big sign that says, Arbeit macht frei. Again, the men in the striped uniform looking at us young people and saying, 14, Stranats, Tizanet, in every language, 14. 14. What does he mean by 14? He looks at a man and he says, you are a tailor, you are a shoemaker, you are a doctor, you are a musician. What is that? We see a band playing young men and young women with the, in the striped uniform, playing classical music. What is that? You don't know. This is hell. Stand straight. He sees a woman with a baby in her arm. Give the baby to your, brother, to your mother. Give the little girl away. Stand straight. Take off your kerchief. All the men in striped uniform, they are giving the orders. The SS men are going for the... You don't know. What is this? Where are we? Out comes this tall man with the shiny boots and with a rubber stick in his hand. I see his face. I cannot erase it. This is Dr. Joseph Mengele. He came to our row. He pointed to my niece to go to the left, to me to go to the left. As I pass the man's row, my father is in the same line. He lifts his head, hand over my head, as he did every Friday night to bless us. He said, Judy, you will live. These were the last words that I saw. We went to the left. They went to their death. And your family who went to the death? My mother my aunt, my aunt's children, my, my uncle, my brother-in-law, uh, Miriam and, and Berta, my sister, and, and my uncles and my aunts and my cousins and all that. My brother at that point was in the Mukatabo, in the slave labor camp. All of them went to the left? Yes. Do you know why you were chosen to go to the right? The reason that he chose the young, 
healthy people is because he needed people for work. He said, if the war ends at 12 o'clock, at 11.55, he will have time to kill the rest of us. He didn't pick us to live. He picked because he needed people for work. But you didn't pick your mother to work. No, my mother did not. My sister, my sister was at that point maybe 30, 35. He didn't pick her. She wore a kerchief. She did. I don't know. You had to be, when he looked at a girl, and she looked to him healthy enough, and he asked her, how old are you? That's where the 13, 14 came in. And she said 13. She went with her mother. If she said 14, she would have gone to the left and used for work. So you do go to the left? We went to the left. You never see your father again? Never saw my p father or no mother, a any of them that way. We went, we came into an enormous building. We had to walk up two steps. There were chairs lined up. Behind each chair was a man in the striped uniform with a machine to cut hair by hand. We were told to get undressed. All, we are all young people. And there are men all over. We were embarrassed. We were get told to get undressed completely naked. If you have any jewels, put it in, the, in, a, in a dish and go and sit down. We sat down. We were, our hair was cut completely bald. We were given a piece of soap into our hands. And we stand in front of a room where it says bath. In our case, it was water. It was cold. It was a cold shower. After we came out of the shower, we were given a plain dress, a, a sheet, no underwear, and a pair of wooden clogs. And I took one look at my niece. I said, Ida, you don't look so good. She says, neither do you. And we stand in line of five, and we waited. We waited hours because till all the people that Mengele selected goes through the shower. At this point, we were just, we don't know for sure that where my parents, where they went. We started marching. We are in in Auschwitz, but we are walking to Birkenau. The entire camp is surrounded with barbed wire. If you touch it, you get electrocuted. After we walk, we start walking after everybody came out. And we, after, in every fifth row, there is an SS man with a gun on one side and an SS woman on the other side. And we start marching. It took one hour walk to be a canal. There is a man, a machine gun, very t uh, a tower where a man with a machine gun is pointing at you. My God, you can't get killed any minute, but you are sort of ready. Where are we going? What is happening to us? Look at us. Nothing good can come out. We, we hardly talk because the SS man said, Scha, kein Reden, es gibt kein Reden da. You are, you are an animal at this point. You don't know where you are, what's going to happen. We come in after an hour walk in Birkenau, and there are all low buildings uh, made out of um, um, brick, brick building, a huge room. 1,400 women fit in there. We were put into bunks, three layers. One is the lower than the middle. Only the one on top has air. Fortunately, the first time we were, we were on top of the bunk. Who's we? Uh, Ida, myself, and other eight other women, one next to another. Eight in one bunk? Eight and one bar. On one level? On one level. There was enough room? Just barely to, to lie there. Within minutes, within 
maybe a half hour since we left. No, it's got to be over an hour since we left Auschwitz. There is suddenly a stench that you cannot breathe. It's like burning hair. You cannot breathe. It is so strong, it makes you cough. I said to a woman that walked by, she was there, she was our supervisor, a couple. I sat in Czech, and she spoke Czech, because there were, uh, there were mostly Slovak girls or Polish. I said, what is that horrible smell? She said, these are your parents burning. As you went through the shower, they went through the gas, and they are burning now. And Ida said, don't listen to her. She is lying. Of course, we knew that this is unfortunately the truth. Because at this point, in 1944, he was already in, deep in Russia. And he, was he thought he was losing the war because he, Stalingrad, they, he was not prepared for the cold. And we knew that one day it will. And they were hoping that it will be in time for us to be safe. It was the most horrible. It was like sitting shiver the first day and the days after. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.